And then the knowledge and work. The knowledge really gets me because I think that's really bad. Uh, uh, human desire that is pushed me. I just needed to know for some reason the answer to things. I, in my study of college, I had to study physics and mathematics because they seemed to me the surest of all disciplines. <laughs> They were going to really produce something here that you could count on, you know. And then in my college career, Einstein did a revolution in my physics, uh, my physics, uh, Newton's physics, uh, and that was a shakeup for me at the time. A wonder shakeup in a way, but it was still a shakeup. And I was a my first job was a chance for aircraft as a mathematician. And the mathematician sitting next to me. I tried to tell him my enthusiasm about Einstein. He just wouldn't hear of it. I mean, he was so committed to that Newtonian things <laughs> that he would not tolerate even hearing about what Einstein had done to his physics. <sighs> well, it's gotten worse since then. <laughs>
10 percent or 20 of the pop population. There are probably two people in the church that remember me. Uh, maybe they don't. Uh, I remember that anyway. <laughs> but the next pastor that came to that church undid everything that I did. Uh, nothing stands in that little church that uh, I found this true of other things. Ben, I, Ken, uh, Alan, and Marshall, who's not here, just finished writing a book called The Road from Empire to Eco Democracy. I mean, that's a damn good book. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. But 10 years from now, all five of us will realize we could have said a little more about this and that and the next thing. And, and a few things that were just plain wrong. I mean, what you achieve in this world is, you get the idea, okay. And again, this termination of your accomplishments uh, is another experience of God. And then finally, Wolfgang talks about uh, self-worth, which is uh, the most painful of all of them. It's almost like you say, well, if I, if I can't be sure about everything, if I can't have the true and beautiful forever, if I have to be driven into solitude and ignorance and I don't know what you call it, or being destroyed, uh, at least I can have a good image of myself. At least I can do my duty. At least I can follow my own conscience or my parents' principles or something. You know? And so you have this view of your, what you should do, uh, what you ought to do, and you try to do it. And what you end up is mastering yourself is not something you ever complete. So you decide you want to be on a great diet. And then you wake up that you've eaten sugar off of every one of these plates in this uh, concert. Uh, and for whatever it is, you know, you, you can find yourself on the way to the icebox for another dish of ice cream or so whatever. When this was not what you would were willing to master yourself to do. Or you wanted to give up smoking, or you wanted to get whatever it was. Uh, mastering yourself became another place where limitation was being met in, in, in your life. Here at Fultmont's uh, script on this, which I think some of the most painful words I've ever read, he says, human existence is well aware that life in accordance with the you are is a struggle, which is a matter of mastering oneself. It knows the call of conscience, which summons to duty and recalls one from thoughtlessness and aberration of everyday things and pronounces the verdict guilty on wasted opportunity, lost opportunity, impure, impure thoughts, and mean actions. The summons of the you are Divesting one of his willfulness and the call of consciousness, showing one his pettiness, incompleteness, and wretchedness, is, guess what? God. He then winds up his story about God with this little quote. God is what limits humankind, who makes a comedy of his care, who allows his longing to miscarry, who casts him into solitude, who sets a limit to his knowing and doing, who calls him to duty and gives the guilty over to torment. Now, as I said a while ago, this, this is a long way from what my Sunday school teacher was teaching me about God. And we could go on here if we wanted to tell our, our, our own stories, I'm sure, about this. But this aspect, what Wilson says is essential in understanding the New Testament and the Old Testament is, is, is not the understanding that we have grown up with and we're not too sure yet what to do with it. But Wilson goes on and gives us a, another little piece. But not only is what he just said clear that in all of these all these thrusts that are just essential to our lives are limited by this mysterious power, but now he's going to tell us this. And yet, at the same time, it is God who forces one into life 
and drives him into care, who puts longing and desire for love in his heart. That is, God puts you here, and here, and here. Who gives him strength and thoughts for his thoughts and strength for his work. And like my place. Uh, places him in the eternal struggle between willfulness and duty. God is the enigmatic power beyond time, yet master of the temple, beyond existence, yet at work within it. So surrounding both the limitations and the puddings is this MP, this mysterious power. Now, the second question comes in. We know this mysterious power, but why not just call it the enigma? Be objective about it and just call it the enigma. Why not just call it uh, fate or maybe nature? Uh, what does it mean to call it God? And this question both on raises. But what we have said is not adequate as a description of a Christian idea of God, nor indeed of the idea of God at all. For why do we call this dark power God? Why give the enigma, the mystery which drives us this way and that, hedges us in? Any other name is simply the enigma or fate. Does the name God not gloss over the fact that we are in the dark and at the mercy of fate? Or if there is to be a name, why not equally well that of the devil? Does not this power play a cruel game with us, destroying and annihilating? Is not unfulfillment the mark of every life? Is not death nothingness? The end? But one goes on to say this kind of questioning is a temptation. That faith in God means that in the face of this enigma, in the face of this darkness, we insist on the meaningfulness of life, of realistically living your life with the cry of nevertheless. Book on again. This nevertheless. Is in any event a meaning of faith in God? Is the courage to designate the dark enigma, that sovereign power of God, as my God? Is the courage to assert that in the knowledge and power, every being acquires its meaning? In the, in, the, in the knowledge of this power, every being acquires its meaning. In knowledge of this power, I also realize I belong to it, and that the limit which fences my being about is inwardly removed. This will, of course, happen when I give up my pretense to make my own way, when I submit to this power as that which has brought me into existence, when I say yes to it. Faith in God is the courage to utter this nevertheless. And Bultmann quotes this 23rd verse of the 73rd Psalm. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me in my right hand. So, this is Bultmann's witness to us about what God is and what faith in God means. He's made very clear that the word of God is a devotional word in the sense that it's a relationship you take. It's a passion of your life toward uh, something. And, and he's made it also clear what we're pointing to, what he's pointing to, what he claims the New Testament and the Old Testament is pointing to with this word and therefore with this, with this faith. So, this is a real crisis of faith. Are we going to call this mysterious power that everybody is putting us and limiting us our God? Everyone faces this choice. This is a crisis in the very roots of all choosing. 